We're on Daf Yud Tesom and Aleph, and we're up to Shabbat Safon. So let's see if I could tell you where we're up to here. We are approximately when the lines the lines get wider and we'll count down let's see how to um second it's approximately i would say about 10 lines down of the wide lines Now let's just put the Gemara into perspective here. We're learning a Mishnah in Mesechta Midos. And the Mishnah tells us that there were six Lishakos, that means six chambers in the Azara in the courtyard. Three in the Tzafon, three in the Dorom, and the three in the Durham, we went through this last time with Lishkas HaMelech, Lishkas HaParva, Lishkas HaMadichim. And we went through each one of these chambers and what their purposes were. In addition, there were three chambers in the Tzofan, in the north of the Azara, Lishkas HaEitz, Lishkas HaGola, Lishkas HaGozis. And the Gemara mentions Rav Papa the statement of Rav Papa to the effect that there was there were actually two chambers for the Kohen Gadol. You know what I'm thinking? Maybe it's Kedai. We'll go a little backwards just to put things in perspective, and we'll go through we'll go through the statement of Rav Papa. Which is Let's count down from the wide lines. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six lines down from the, from the beginning of the wide lines. We're on Daf Yutes Amid Aleph. So the line starts with the word Vinichnas. And it says, Achas Bedorom. We said that. The um, there were three lashakos in the Dorom. This nan we learned in the Mishnah Shiva Sha'arim Hayu Bazar. So the Mishnah in Masech Midos says that there were seven gateways that led into the Azar. Shlosha Batzafon, Shlosha Bedorom, Vyachid Bid Mizra. Shebedorom, so we're now on the southern side of the, the Azara. Shar Hadlaka, and we said last time that the Shar Hadlaka was a place where they kept the wood for the fire on the Maroch on top of the Mizbeach. And Shani Lo, now we're moving from the south east over to the southwest, the Shani Lo Shara Karbon. And we said that the Shara Karbon 
is there for the Tamid, the carbon Tamid. So the the Shar on the Durham was the Sharad Lok, as we said, and then Shani Lo Shara Karbon, Shlishi Lo Shar Hamayim. Now the Shara Mayim was where they took the water for the Misuch Hamayim on Chagasukos. And this was the last thing we learned last week. Sheba Mizrach, on the eastern side, there was Shar Nikonor. So the main entrance into the Azara was on the eastern side, and that was through the Shar Nikonor. In other words, when you went into the Mizrach through the Shar Nikonar, then you, <coughs> you found two Lishakos, two chambers. One was on the right and one was on the left. Okay, all this we did last week. Now, Shabbat Safon, now what's on the northern side of the Azara is Shar Nitzos. And this we didn't discuss yet. There are two Shitos here, how to interpret the Shar Nitzos. Nitzos could either mean a ray of light, and this shire was open on one side. So the light came in. It was flooded by sunlight during the day. And that's what the word nitzots means. Nitzots means a ray of the sun. However, there's a comment here of the Tferes Yisrael, the super commentary on the Mishnayis. And he understands that the word nitzots means a spark, an ember. And what they did was, in the Sharon Nitzots, according to the Tiferes Yisrael, they kept a fire going there, a very small fire, just in case the fire on the Marocha, the Mizbeach, would go out. If it was extinguished, they would go into the Sharon Nitzots and they would rekindle it. So we're now on the north side. Now, the Mishnah describes a structure that you went into from the Sharon Nitzots, which is called Binyan Achsadrahoya, Valia Bnuyalo Al Gabov. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of this. But what I think it is, it's a kind of a structure that has a dome on top of it. That's what I think is the word achsadra. Achsadra is a word that's always indicative of a roof without walls. But in this case, there are walls, but it's open on one side. So they give it the name achsadra. And there's a dome on top. And what was the purpose of this structure? It had a lower part to it on the ground level. And then if you climbed up to the top of the dome, on the higher level, you got a very good view. And here we get into what's called the Mitzvah Shmiras Migdash, which means to protect the base of Migdash. Now, when we say protect the base of Mikdash, we don't mean that we're afraid that anyone's going to, you know, rob the Mikdash. You know, their mortars are going to come in and take over the Mikdash. <clears throat> but the Mikdash is like the palace of Kaviyochol, and a palace always has to have guards around. This is the mitzvah of Mora Migdash, of the fear and the awe that we have of the Migdash. And the Levim, 
were in charge of the bottom level and they sent they would send and set up guards on the bottom level of the Sharanitzot and the Kohanim would climb up to the top and they were positioned as shomrim, as guards on the top. So that's what it says here. Aliyah b'nuyelo al gabov. So on the top story of this building, there was an upper level, v'sham kanim shomrim, milamala. So the shomrim climbed up on top, and that's where they did the guarding of the migdosh. The Levim were on the lower level, ground level, what we call. And all this is based on a Pasuk in Sefer Bamidbar, Perikirches, that requires Mora Migdosh. Okay. No, I'm sorry, not lechol, but lechel. If it says lechol, then there's a mistake in the print. It should say lechel. Now, we know that the, the sanctity of the Migdash, to some extent, extends to encompass the entire Harabais. So, for example, a Tome mess has to be sent out not only of the Mach which includes the Azora, and even beyond that, which is called the Ezra's Noshim, but the entire Harabais. Now, when you entered into the Harabais, the first place that you got to was called the Chel. And the Chel was set aside from the rest of the Harabais with what's called the Soreg. Soreg is a kind of a of a fence that is woven. Notice it has both directions. Anyway, the status of the Chel is lower than that of the Azara, but higher and a more intense sanctity than the Harabais. So, this has to do with what's called Shiluach Machnos as far as Atomi is concerned. Now, by virtue of the fact that this structure that we're talking about in the northern side of the Azara, which is called the Sharon Nitzots, and there was at that location a building which would open up into the Chel. As a result, it would seem that this area had a certain kind of Kedusha to it, and the proof is that the Tommy Mess was sent out of the Chel. But on the other hand, it doesn't have that high level of Kedusha, the intensity of the Azara. So let's say, for example, it could be, again, you have to know more about this, but a Tommy Sheretz, well, or a Balkeri, let's say, would be allowed into the Chel, whereas he's not allowed into the Azor, which is already the Mach Neshechidu. 
Now, Shani Lo, now we're on the second, second to this um, Shar Hanitzot. <coughs> and we're moving now towards the west. So we're in the north, but we're moving west. And that is called the Shar HaKarban. And the Shara Karban is where they would bring a Karban Ola, Chatos, or an Osham entering into the Azar through the Shara Karban. And those three categories of Ola, Chatos, and Osham are called Kodshim, Kodshim, Kodshim. And Kodshay Kodshim requires Shechita B'Tzafon, like we say every morning, based on the Mishnayis in Zvachim, Eizim HaKom and Zvachim. And you'll see there that all the Karbonas that we mentioned, Kodshay Kodshim, Shechita B'Tzafon. And now we're in the northern side of the Azara, so it makes sense that they went through the Shara Karbon on the north, bringing all these animals of those three categories of carbonos for shechita on the northern side. Now again, we're moving from east to west. Shlishilo, the third chamber, or I should say the third gate on the west, is Shar Beis Mokeit. And Base Mokeh means that once again, we needed a structure from which we would take the fire for the Mizbeach. In any event, the bottom line, again, a lot of this is a bit choppy because we started this last week and we should have finished, but we ran out of time last week. The bottom line of all this is to is to declare is to simply determine that the Shara Mayim, which is where the Kohen Gadol was tovel in the mikvah for seven days when he was porish before Yom Kippur, this was all on the southern side. That's what we saw in this Mishnah. Betanya, we also see in a brisa chamesh tvilos vasar kiduchim tovel Kohen Gadol makadish bo bayom. So on Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol went into the mikvah five times and he did what's called Kiddush Yadayim Vraglayim ten times. That means every time he went to the mikvah, before he went to the mikvah, he did Kiddush Yadayim Vraglayim, and after he came out of the mikvah, he did Kiddush Yadayim Vraglayim. So we multiply five times two is ten. So there were 10 times during the course of Yom Kippur that the Kohen Gadol did Kiddush Yadayim Vraglayim. Okay. The Kulam Bakodesh Al Gad Beis Parva. Where was the mikvah of the Kohen Gadol located? It was located on the roof of a structure called the Beis Parva. Now, the word parva here has nothing to do with milchiks or fleshiks. It is the name of the person who actually built this bias, or at least he built the mikvah on top of the roof of the bias. And who was this guy named parva? So we'll see later on, on daf, maybe it's Lamedalid. A, a very strange statement in the Gemara that this parva was actually a machashet. <laughs> he was a sorcerer. And he dug underground below the Beis HaMikdash, supposedly because he was very curious to see what was going on in the Mikdash. He wanted to watch the Avoda, especially the Kohen Gadol, but they wouldn't allow him in either because he was a guy or because he was a sorcerer, a makashev. 
So he, through his kitshuv, was able to dig underground. And he dug out a whole structure under the ground. The top level of that structure was equal to the, to the, to the Azara. Very strange that we would name a structure in the Migdash in the Azara after a sorcerer. Very strange. According to the to Ferris Yisrael, again, he wasn't a saucer. What the Gemara meant to say that his feat was so amazing that people attributed to sorcery, but he wasn't really a sorcerer. But that's just the Ferris Yisrael. Everyone else assumes the Gemara Kipshuta that he was a machashet. So again, on top of this base haparva, there was a mikvah, and that's where the coin was tovel time after time during the course of Yom Kippur, and it was in the Kodesh, because the Torah says, Kodesh, which we'll read this Shabbos. And the Mokom Kodesh means the Azara. So there had to be a mikvah located in the Azara itself, and that was the God, the roof of the Beis HaParva. Now, the Kulon Bakodesh, all five tvilos had to be implemented in the Azara, in the Kodesh, with the exception of one of the five. Chutz Mizu. What does it mean, Chutz Mizu? Again, we mentioned that there was a place called the Shar Hamayim. And that's a mikvah. What was that status of the Shar Hamayim? The Shar Hamayim was not in the Azara. And that would be used by anyone who wanted to enter into the Azara and he needed a Tvila before he entered into the Azara. So the Kohen Gadol, when he started his Avoda in the morning, he would be Tovel in the Sharamayim outside of the Azara. The other four Tvilos the Kohen Gadol is already inside the Azara, he would have to do those tefillos in the Azara. So we needed a second mikvah, which was located inside the Azara. And that was located in the, on the Gag of the Beis HaParv. But this one, meaning the very first tefillah, Chaisa Bechol Agabi Sharmai. Okay. Now, where was the Sharamayim? I'm sorry, start again. So are we talking now about the base of Harvard? Just one second. Oh, yeah, I was right. Ubitsad Lichkaso Hoiso. The Sharamayim. which again, as we said, is outside the Azura, and it was a mikvah that would allow the coin Godol or any coin to go into the Azura, that was situated Bitsad Lishkoso, I saw, in close proximity to the chamber of the coin Godol, which means that when the coin Godol woke up in the morning, right next door to his chamber was the Sharamayim, so that he didn't have to run around and circle all around to make that effort in order to be Tovil. So the first Tvila was in the Charmayim, which was located right next to the chamber of the Kohen Godel, the Lichka of the Kohen Godel. Now, all this, if you recall, is Rav Papa, based on the Mishnah in Avos and Abrais. But Rav Papa adds a comment. He says, I'm not sure. Okay, now, before we go on, let's just main, review what we learned in terms of what's called the base Avtinus. Avtinus, you recall, was that family and they were experts 
in manufacturing the Ketores. Not only that, they knew the avoda of the Ketores. They knew on, on Yom Kippur there was a very complicated avoda of what's called chafina, in which case the Kohen Gadol has to dig his two hands and bring up a cup full of Torres, and he's going to have to transfer that into a kaf. He's got to hold a machta, which has gecholim in it, in his right hand, and the kaf with the Torres in his left hand, he's got to run into the Kodesh Kadoshim and he has to do the avoda, which is called Chafina. So again, if I had a whiteboard, or if you could write this down, Chafina. Chafina means digging his hands in. So during the seven days of Prisha, when the Kohen Godel was quarantined into his chamber, which is called the Lichkas Farhedrin, he would have to go over to the base of Tinus on a daily basis for seven days. And these experts would train him in the Avodas Chafino, so that when Yom Kippur came around, he was well trained for a very complicated, a very complicated uh, avod. Now, where was I should, let me say, there were these two Lishakos, these two chambers. One is the Lishkas Farhedrin, where the Kohen Gadu would live and sleep at night for those seven days before Yom Kippur. And the Lishkas base of Tinus, where the Kohen on a daily basis would go into that Lishka in order to be trained in the Avodas Chafina Saktores. The simplest answer to that question intuitively would be that they were right next to each other, contiguous. So the Kohen Gadol would not have to trouble himself to walk all around the Chatzar in order to get to the uh, Lishkas Avtinus, base Avtinus. However, from everything that we learned until now, it seems that the Lishkas Farhedrin and the base, Lishkas base Havtinus were on two different sides, one on the north and one on the south. We're not sure why. Why did they have to locate them so far apart? But that's not the first question the Gemara is going to address. The first question is Lo Yadana i Lishkas Farhedrin Bitsafon, the Lishkas base Havtinus Bidorom. O Lishkas Beis Avtinus Bitsafon, O Lishkas Farhedrin Bidoro. So we know one of these two Lishakos between Farhedrin and Beis Avtinus was in the north, the other is in the south. We don't know which was in the north and which was in the south. And Rav Pop is raising this question and he's going to give what he thinks is the most logical, intuitive answer to this question. It's logical to assume the Lishkas Farhedrin Bidarom Havi. Where would they locate the Lishkas Farhedrin? In the Dorom. Now, the reason for that is because, as we said before, the very first Tvila in Mikvah of the Coin Gadol to kick off the day would take place. In the Sharamayan. So it would make sense that, if I could use this phrase, it's not a nice phrase, but that when the coin gold rolled out of bed in the morning, he would roll out into the, right next to the mikvah, which was in the Sharamayan. Now the Sharamayan was on the southern side. Of the Azor. So it would make sense there for the Lishkas Farhedrin being contiguous to the Sharamayim would also be on the south side. My timer. 
So what's the reason that Rav Papa claims that logically it would make more sense to assume that the Lishkas Farhedrin rather than the Lishkas Beis Haftinus is on the southern side? Because Makdim, now what does the word Makdim mean? Lakdim means to early. Koi, Koi means to get up. So when the Kohen Gadol got up very early, Mesech Esraglov, the first thing he do, did is, if you pardon the expression, he had a bowel movement. That he was regulated so that in the morning he did a bowel movement. He had to clean up his, his innards, his insides. And now, before he enters into the Azara to do the Avoda, he has to go to the Mikvah. Again, he's got to go to a Mikvah outside the Azara because after he's Mesech Raglov, after the bowel movement, he's not allowed to enter into the Azara without a Tmila. That's true for any Kohen. Now, the phrase Mesech Raglov, the Gemara is going to try to explain that what that means. I mean, Raglov means his feet, and Mesech means to cover over something, like Milosh and Sukkah. So the Gemara is going to explain why that phrase is idiomatic expression of, of a bowel movement. But in any event, now the Kohen Gadol has to go into the mikvah. He's going to the mikvah outside the Azor. That's in the Shara Mayim. That's the first of his five tefillos of the day. And he goes immediately Vitavil right next to his, his Lishkas Farhedrin. Because again, every day of the seven days of quarantine, he slept in the Lishkas Farhedrin. He went in the morning to the mikvah in the Shara Mayim. The Shara Mayim was on the southern side. It makes sense to assume that his living quarters were also on the southern side. So he doesn't have to go drag around to find the mikvah. Okay, fine. But now, if the Lishkas Farhedrin is on the southern side, then by process of elimination, the Lishkas base of Tinus is on the, on the northern side. Is therefore Ozil at Safon. After he comes out of the mikvah, he relocates himself from the southern side of the Azorah over to the northern side of the Azorah. For Gomar, Gomar means he studies, like Gemara is a study. Chafina. Chafina is, as we said before, the unique avoda of the Torres on Yom Kippur. And every day during the seven days of Prisha, he would make his way from the base Hamayim on the southern side over to the base Haftinus on the northern side, and in that Lishaka, in that Lishka, the chamber of the Avtinus family, that's where we learn how to do the Avoda of the Ketoris, which is called Chafina. And at that point, Osi Lebeis HaMikdash, when he finished learning in that chamber of the Avtinus family, he can now go into the base of Migdosh, the Ovid Avodna Kulioma. During every one of those seven days of Prisha, he was preoccupied with Avodna from morning until evening. Now they're ready to lock up the base of Migdosh at the end of the day. Migdosh is closed for business. And Lebahadi Panya, towards the evening, Panya. Like the Gemara in Bameh Malikin is twilight. Madu le. Madu is the same as Mazu. The Dalid in Aramaic replaces the Zion in Lashon Kodesh. And we have a whole sugya, if you recall, at the beginning of Masech Yoma about the daily Hazos that they sprinkled the Mechatos on the Kohen Gadol. And here we have a Machlokis Tanoim. One Shita is, Rabbi Meir, that every single day of the seven days they did Azor. And 
the Tanakhama holds no. All you need is on the third day of his quarantine and the seventh day of his quarantine. But be that as it may, the Hazor took place towards the evening. The Hadar Ozil Adarham Vitovil night. Now he goes back to the south because his day is ended. He's no longer doing the Avoda. And therefore, his Tvila to close the day would take place in the Shara Mayim, which we said is on the southern side. He's now going to walk through the Chatzar, through the Azara, from north to south in order to go to sleep for the night in the Lishkas Farhedrin after he does his final Tvila. Now, I'm a little bit confused about this language of a papa. He says, the Hadar Lebahadi Panya Madu Ale, the Hadar Ozil Lidoro, and it says Vitovil. I'm not sure what that word Vitovil means. I know it means to be Tovil, and I know the Tvila took place in the Charmayim all the way back on the south. I'm just not 100% sure. Who actually needs that tvila? Because if the Kohen Gadol is going to sleep for the night and he's going to wake up the next morning and do a tvila after he does a bowel movement, I don't know why he has to close his day with a tvila in the Sharamayan. I'm tempted, but don't, don't laugh me out of the ballpark here, to think that the Vitovil here is not a reference to the coin Gunnel per se, but rather to the coin of Mazer. Because if you learn Pasha's Chukas, the Pasha, the Paraduma, there's a very strange halacha, which Shlomo Melch himself couldn't understand, that the Mazer, who is effectuating Ara, he himself becomes Tomei by virtue of his contact with the Mechat. So it occurs to me that maybe the Tvila here is the Tvila of the Mazat, because we just mentioned the Haza of the Mechatas on the Kohen Godel. But be that as it may, it says, Vinayach. So now Rav Pop explains his logic. Why do I assume intuitively? that the location of the Lichkas Farhedrin was on the south. If you're going to tell me that the coin wakes up in the morning, and after the retirement for the night, he wakes up early, and he's located in the Lichkas Farhedrin on the northern side of the Azara, is then Makdim, he gets up in the morning, Koi, Umesich Raglo, the Ozil He's got to go from the north to the Shara Mayim, which is in the south. So again, forget about the base of Tinas for a moment. One thing we know without a shadow of a doubt that the Shara Mayim for the mikvah, for the Tvila outside the Azor is definitely in the south. The Azil Adoram Vitoval the Gomar Hafino. So the problem is that you are imposing on the Kohen Gadol to have to go all the way around the Azara in order to, because again, he can't go into the Azara when he wakes up in the morning because after Mesech Raglov, no one's allowed into the Azara before Tvila. So he's got to now relocate himself in the base of Mayim outside the Azor. He's going to have to make the entire circuitous route 
circling the entire around the entire Azara from the north where his Liskas Farn Hedge and where he slept, all the way over to what? To the Sharamayim in the south. And then, of course, Asi the Beis Amigdash, Ovid Avodu Kuliyoma. And what happens at the end of the day? Lahadi Panya, when it's towards the end of the day, Maduale, they do Aza. The Hodar Ozil, Ladorom. And now he's got to go. He's, he's got to basically retrace his steps. Why? Because he needs a tefillah at the end of the day, we said in the Sharmayim. So imagine, he started his day in the Sharmayim on the south side after schlepping from the Liskas Farhedrin all the way over to the south, went back into the Azar to do the Avoda of the day. And then at night, he has to close the day with another Tvila on the south side. So he's going all the way back to the south. And now he's going to sleep in the Lishkas for Hedrin, and he retires in the north side, again taking him all the way back to the north side. Umi Torah Machachina Lekule Hai? Are we going to impose such a tircha? A frustrating, you know, it's almost like going around and around and around. I mean, the Azor was pretty large, it was pretty long. Therefore, says Rav Papa, it would make more sense to assume that the Lishkas for Hedrin is on the south side, next to the Sharamayim. So that when he wakes up in the morning, he goes right into the mikvah in the Sharamayim. And therefore, the base of Tinus is located in the north side. And that would make a lot more sense. So let's just summarize what we did so far. If the Lishkas Farahedrin is in the north, then when the coin goddle arises in the morning, he's got to walk all the way around the entire Azara in order to go to the mikvah, which is on the south side of the Sharamayim. And the reason for that is because, again, he's not allowed to go into the Azara without first being Tovel after his Mesech Raglov. And number two, even if he would be allowed to enter the Azara, he would be using the Azara as a shortcut. That's called a Campandria. And the Gemara is going to tell us later on and it's based on a mission in Brachos that you're not allowed to go through a, even a Besak Neses as a shortcut. The whole issue today during Corona, the outdoor shuls, whether you're allowed to go through those outdoor shuls as a shortcut. All right, it doesn't have a din of a Besak Neses. It's only temporary. Now we're going back to shuls. So by placing, if you locate the Lishkas Farhejan in the north side, then you're really Im imposing a burden on the Kohen go. And the Gemara throws a curveball. I'll love a low. Why not? <laughs> what do you mean, why not? You know, the Kohen Gadol is a human being. Let's have compassion. Why do we have to impose on him all this terrible burden? Ah, says the Gemara, I'll tell you why. To eat stokihu lifrosh. When we accept applications from candidates for the position of Kohen Gadol, especially during Bai Shani, many of those candidates were Tztukim. We'll talk about the Tztukim in a minute. So why not discourage the Tztukim? And tell them it's not worth it for you to become Kohen Gadol. Let's discourage their candidates, their applicants. How do we discourage someone? 
you know, today in, in the state of Israel, everybody wants to be a Chavar Knesset or a Sar or maybe Rosh Mem Shalah. And I would assume that Kohen Gadol is a pretty important position. Why not apply? But that Stokim did not have the same fierce motivation, intense, profound motivation that the Prushim had. And therefore, we could discourage them by indicating what a schlep it is, what a burden it is, what a terchet is to be Kohen Gadol. So Adarabha, we have an agenda to make it a little bit difficult for the Kohen Gadol to discourage the Tzdokim. And we'll talk about the Tzdokim in just a minute. Inami, I'll give you another reason to justify why we make, make it a little bit hard for the Kohen Gadol. He shouldn't be conceited. You know, oh, everything has to be comfortable for me because I have the high position of the Kohen Gadol. Let's give him a little sense of humility and shiftless and make him work a little harder. So you cannot convince me, Rav Papa, that the Lichkas Farhedrin is located in the south simply to make life easier for the Kohen Gadol. The Elo Tamar, if you don't agree with me that we're trying to make it a little bit more challenging and a bit more of a burden on the shoulders of the Kohen Gadol, then Navdinu Lichavayu Bahari Adotin. In other words, why don't we put the chambers both next to each other? You admit to me that the chambers are separated from each other. Right, you have the base of Tinus, where the coin is going to go into the chamber and learn how to do the Chafino, the Avod of the Torahs, and you have the Lishkas Farhedrin. You admit to me that one is in the north and one is in the south. You're not sure which is which. But why not put them contiguous one to the other? So you'd have the Sharmayim outside the Azara, where he goes to the mikvah in the morning. You have the Lishkas Farhedrin, and in the Azara, you have the base of Tinus right next to it. All of them could be contiguous. Inami, tizge lei bechada. Why not we? Why not allow the Kohen Gadol to spend seven days living in the base of Tinus? Meaning, we don't even need two different chambers. One for sleeping and one for practicing the Avodah the Chafino. Put it all together. So we see clearly that we're not trying to make life so, so easy for the Kohen Gadol. The Ramam in Hilchus Beis HaBechira, Perkei, Paskins, that in fact, the base of Tinus was in the south, and the Lishkas Farhedrin was in the north. All right, now we get back to our Mishnah. The Mishnah says, Omrulo. Now, when the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur is ready to go into the Kodesh Kadoshim to implement the Avoda, the Ktores, then the members of the court say to him, Ishi Kohen Gadol, my great, my, my great, uh, what, what work we use, master, my master, the Kohen Gadol. We are Shluchei Bezdin, and we are sending you as our Shliach, and therefore you are a Shliach of our Bezdin, and promise us, take an oath, that you will do the avod of the Ketoros properly. Now, let's just go over this one more time. Why is it that on Yom Kippur, it was such a profound contention between the Tztukim and the Pruchim? The Tztukim 
understood the pasuk to mean that the anan of the Torah has to be taken in into the Kodesh Kadosh. That Kaviyochal Kodesh Baruch wants to see the anan entering into his private ado- uh, abode, the, the Kodesh Kadosh. And therefore, the Tsukim interpreted this passage to mean that the coin Gadol, before he entered into the Kodesh Kadoshim, took the Ktores and put it down on top of the Gecholim, on top of the coals, and the pillar of smoke went up. And then, and only then, would he be allowed to enter into the Kodesh Kadosh. The Pruchim came to the exact opposite of conclusion. And maybe if we get a chance, we'll take a look at the Psukim that we're going to read this Parsha, the Shabbos, and you'll see how the Prushim interpreted the Psukim beautifully, that the Kohen Gadol came in to the Kodesh Kadoshim, holding the Macht of Gichon with one hand and the Ktores in the other hand, and he put the Ktores on top of the Gecholim inside the Beis HaMikdash, after he entered into the Mikdash. But when the Bezdin warned the Kohen Gadol that he has to get this right and do it like the Prushim and not like the Tzutim, they called the Kohen Gadol the Shliach of the Bezdin. Lema Tevi Tufta the Rav Huna Bereder of Yoshua the Omar of Huna Breder of Yeshua, Hani Kani Shluchi Drachmana Ninu. The Kohen Gadol and all the Kohenim are the Shluchim, not of the human court of the Bezdin, but of Rachmana, of the, of the Almighty God. So, for example, Rabosai, let's say that you bring. A karman, Yochayev a karman chatos, ledugma. And you come into the Migdash with your karman and you give it over to the Kohen. Is the Kohen your agent or is he the agent of the Ribbon Shalom? Is he representing the Mizbeach and he's saying, I'm going to do the karma, the Avodasa karma on the Mizbeach, or is he representing the violin? Because the Bailam is, he can't do the Avod, he's not a coin. So he points the coin as his Shlia. And Rav Kahana says, I'm sorry, Rav Huna says, that the coin is the Shlia of Rachmona. Now, this is a sugya, my mind of Gimino, like what difference to make Alpidin, whether he's a Shlia of the Rebote Shalom or the Shlia. Of the of of the Bailin. And this leads us to a sugya called Mudar Hana Mechavero. Again, once again, as I said before about Hafino, if I had the whiteboard, I'd write this up on the whiteboard. Mudar Hana Mechavero. And that's a kind of a neder when a person says, I will not have any benefit from Yankel. In this case, Yankel is the Kohen who is on duty and I took a neder that I won't have any benefit from him. I cannot send him as my agent to represent me as a shliach because in doing so I would have hana from him and I'd be violating my neder. And the Gemara says it depends. If Kohen is a shliach rachmana, he's not your shliach. He's doing the bidding of HaKadosh Baruch is the agent of God. But if Shluche Didan, then you're benefiting from his Shlichus, because when he's Mekayim and Shlichus, you're benefiting from that, and you're getting Hano from a Mudra Hano. The Iyamr Shluche Didan Ninu, if you're going to tell me that the Kohenim, or the Kohen Gadol on Yom HaKippurim, is our Shliach. And here we turn to Dafyut Tesam and Beis. Is Mi Kamidi 
Danan lo matzinu lemevad ushluchi didan matzi lemevad. You are not allowed to send a shliach to do something on your behalf which you yourself couldn't do. So the basic fundamental underlying principle of shlichus is if I non lo matzim avdinon shluchi didan lami lo matzim avdinon. And therefore, Rav Kahana, I, I keep saying Rav Kahana, I mean Rav Huna, is of the opinion that because you as a Baal HaKorban could not possibly appoint a coin as your shliach since you yourself could not do the avoda, he can't do the avoda as your proxy, as your agent. And yet, our Mishnah seems to assume that the Kohen Gadol is our agent because the Bezdin is saying you better fulfill your agency on behalf of the Bezdin. The Gemara now reinterprets the Mishnah. This is what they told the Kohen Gadol. Meaning, you are really the shliach of the Ribbona Shalom. You're not our shliach. But the shvua, the oath that we're going to impose, is an oath al das bezdin. It's as if the court itself is implementing, administering this oath. And when an oath is administered by the bezdin, it has the most profound validity, tokef. Now the Mishnah tells us who poreshu bochav, heim porchenu bochit. I can understand why the coin Gadol is crying, because they are saying to him, hey, are you a tztuki? I mean, that's pretty humiliating. Why are they crying? They suspected that he would go into the Avodo of the Ketores and he would put the Ketores on the Gecholim before he entered into the Kodesh Kadoshim. That's very humiliating. I don't know if you've ever experienced this where somebody suspected you of a serious crime. Very humiliating. Heim portion of Boshkim, why are they crying? The Omer Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi call Hachoshe Bikshirim Loke Begufo. This is a sugya that we learned in Mesech the Shabbos. And it has to do with Moshe Rabbeinu. You remember that Moshe Rabbeinu was arguing with HaKadosh Baruch Hu for a full week at the snare, refusing to accept upon himself to be the Redeemer of Israel. And at one point, Hashem says to Moshe, put your hand inside your bosom, and he takes it out, and it's Tsaras. Tsaras, as we learned last week, last Shabbos, I mean, is a punishment for suspecting someone and speaking derogatory about them which is what Moshe Rabbeinu was guilty of, because he said to the Rebona Shalom, I'm going to come and show up. I'm the Redeemer. I was sent by the Almighty to redeem you from two centuries of slavery, and they won't believe me. HaKadosh Baruch says, what do you mean they won't believe you? They will believe you. They are Bale Amuna, and they have the Amuna, the faith that they received in transmission from the others, and you suspect them, and you'll get saras. That's called Loka Bibufa. And now the Bezdin realize that they are falsely suspecting this Kohen Gadol of being a Tztuki by being Mashbia him, that he's not a Tztuki, is Hachoshe Bikshirim Loka Bibufa. And what's this all about? This shvua? Why are we, why are we getting so nervous about it? 
שלא יסכן מבחוץ להיכנס כדרך שהצדוקים עושים. What we're afraid of is lest he set up the Torah on top of the Gecholim, outside the Kodesh Kadoshim, and he's going to do it the way that Stukim did it. And as a result, my friends, the Avoda is an Avoda Psula, because now we go back to the Pasuk. The Pasuk says, Al Yovo Bechol Esal HaKodesh Mi Beis LaParoches, Ki Be'anan Eroa Al HaKapores which according to the Tzduke means that you already have to set up the Anan before the royal Aktores, and he has to already set up the burning of the Ktores and the Anan before he enters. And the Kohen Gadol is not allowed to go into the Kodesh Kadoshim until he has the cloud, that pillar of smoke that came from the burning Ktores, He's got to, therefore, according to Tzdukim, place the Torahs on the Gecholim before he goes into the Kodesh Kadoshim. However, the Prushim had a Kabbalah that was handed down ish mi pi ish from one generation all the way back to Moshe Rabbeinu, that the Torahs is going to be placed on the Gecholim inside the Kodesh Kadoshim. The Tzdukim therefore denied the validity of Torah Shemal Peh. And according to their interpretation of, of, of the Tzdukim, they misinterpreted the Tzdukim. And the Ramah has a very radical understanding of the Tzdukim. He claims that really what came first is they were heretics. They denied Torah Shemal Peh. They looked for an excuse to rationalize their kfira of Torah Shemal Peh, and they found a good excuse. We can deviate from Torah Shemal Peh because here I'll, I'll prove to you that you're wrong in your interpretation of the Torah and the law. But this was just a an external way in which they can rabble rouse against the Prusha. Now, what we're going to do, Mir Shem, next week is we're going to discuss a certain Stuki and the terrible punishment that was meted out to this Stuki, who was a Kohen Gadol, and he did the Avoda like the Stuki. So that'll be a Mir Shem. Ah, wait a minute. Forget it. Not next week. Next week, you're all invited to my house for Lagba Omer. And we'll have a lot of fun. A mitzvah shem, a nice... I have a view here a few feet away from me of about 15 bonfires here in Harnof. So the address is Shalzin 16. You know, put it into ways. And come along, wives, children. And I think we're starting officially at 7 p.m. I hope I'm not wrong about that. Let me just, uh, give me a second to double check that.